Before the holidays, we did the class about bringing Mashiach today, and at the end of it, we discussed a number of customs and practices that are of non-Jewish origin that infiltrated Judaism in recent centuries, and we briefly alluded to the, the whole idea of going to graves of righteous people, great rabbis, biblical figures, but we didn't really discuss it. And one of the most common questions that came up was, is it permitted to go to the graves of tzaddikim to participate in these kind of pilgrimage uh, practices? The Lubavitcher Rebbe's oil in Queens, the Rabbi Nachman's uh, oil in Uman in Ukraine, those are very popular today, and many others. There are graves of tzaddikim in Israel. There are graves outside of Israel. Is there a difference if they're in Israel or they're not in Israel? What's the proper practice? So today we want to basically, we want to discuss in depth this whole idea of visiting the graves of tzaddikim. Where did this practice come from? Is it kosher? Are you allowed to go? If you're allowed to go, what are you allowed to do? Can you pray? What can you pray? How should you pray? That's what we want to discuss. So this is really a follow-up to the, the previous class before the holidays. And I intended to do it right after, but then there were other things to discuss, and then the holidays came. But it's actually, I think, appropriate that we end up doing it tonight, because tomorrow is Halloween. And I think it's in the theme of what's happening in the world this week. And so I want to touch on Halloween for a second, because I despise Halloween with a great passion. Uh, (laughs) Halloween is grotesque so-called holiday that really only a very disturbed and mentally ill society could celebrate. And, uh, you know, the whole holiday is really at its core is this glorification of horror and bloodshed and violence and death and evil. And it's just bizarre that society is, is okay with this, this strange pagan death ritual And this is precisely what the Torah forbids many, many times. So remember, among the 613 commandments in the Torah, at least three of them have to do with various forms of necromancy, of attempting to communicate with the dead, channeling the dead. So we talked about this verse several times recently. We discussed it in the Noahide Laws class. If you remember in the Noahide Laws class, The Gemara says that the Noahides are also prohibited in the 10 prohibitions of sorcery mentioned in the Torah. In Sefer Dvarim, the verse is, So you should not have somebody who sacrifices his children, does all kinds of incantations, somebody who's an astrologer and a predictor, a diviner, somebody who tries to predict the future. Uh, and mechashef, uh, uh, witchcraft, wizardry, chover chaver, all kinds of incantations. And the last three are v'sho'el ov, somebody who inquires of ov, which is often translated as ghosts, somebody who tries to communicate with ghosts. Ve'yidoni, yidoni is translated as some kind of spirit, as a knowledge spirit, to get information from the dead, essentially. Ve'doresh alametim, somebody who seeks communication with the dead. These are 10 prohibitions that Jews are forbidden in, of course. They're among the 610 command, 613 commandments. And also the Talmud says even Gentiles are forbidden. This is one of the Noahide, the expanded Noahide laws, that even Gentiles are forbidden in this. So the last three in particular, uh, Of, Yidoni, and Shoel, and Doresh Metim, a Shoel, Of, Of is probably associated with, it's the same root as Av, Avot, of your ancestors, somebody who tries to speak to your ancestors, or uh, ancestor worship, which was really common in ancient times, and Yedoni, somebody who's extracting knowledge, Da'at, Yeda, Yeda is knowledge, somebody who's trying to get knowledge from ghosts and spirits, and Doresh Alametim, somebody who seeks to speak to the dead and goes to cemeteries to do all kinds of dead death rituals, and the Talmud gives us different explanations of how these things were done using various implements, various maybe bones and things like that. All of that is forbidden, and it's forbidden for Jews and non-Jews, and this is the kind of thing that Halloween is all about, all of this strange 
death rituals, communication with the dead, spirits, ghosts, all of that stuff. And, you know, people think that you'll often hear that Halloween comes from a Christian holiday, or at least a Catholic holiday, uh, called All Saints Day or All Hallows Day, which was historically commemorated on November 1st. And so Hallows Eve is, you know, Halloween is October 31st. But actually it comes from a much older pagan European holiday called Samhain. And this was a holiday, it's right at the, it, it was a celebrate on October 31st, because that's when winter would begin, and winter was considered a time of death, everything is lifeless. It was believed by these pagans that that's when all the dead spirits come out, ghosts come out, all these evil forces, the, the side of death comes out in the winter and makes everything lifeless. And it's, it's, they say that the whole idea of the jack-o'-lantern, you know, carving the pumpkin and carving different ground vegetables was meant to scare away the dead spirits. And some say also dressing up in scary costumes was meant to be like to scare away those ghosts and spirits and things like that, like a scarecrow. And trick-or-treating is believed to have evolved from leaving out gifts or offerings to the dead. You would leave on your doorstep uh, some tr whatever it was, not treats, or some offering to the dead spirits so they would leave you alone. And so that's, it all comes from these old uh, European pagan rituals, essentially. And they, there was even something, maybe you've heard of it, called the dance macabre. You've heard of this? Like a dance, yeah. It's in French, basically. They would go to a cemetery and have a party, do like a ritual dance in the cemetery because the dead would, would arise, the dead spirits would arise in the cemetery and you would have a party with those dead spirits. So something like that, a, a ritual a reenactment of the rising dead in the cemetery. So it's all very pagan and very bizarre and totally contrary to the spirit of the Torah. And today Halloween is actually one of the four major festivals of the Wiccans and the neo-pagans and all these uh, strange modern witchcraft and pagan groups. It actually used to be forbidden in America because the Protestants, the original Puritans and Protestants were very opposed to this pagan stuff. And it's only in the 1800s when more Catholics started to come to America, particularly Irish and others, that brought it from Europe over and it started to become more and more acceptable. So it's actually even, it's recent even in America because even Protestant Christians were very opposed to it. And the, the, the most troubling thing is that recently I saw this even people in Israel doing Halloween. Like I see Israelis and people in Israel doing Halloween. So now it's infiltrating the Holy Land and that's completely inappropriate. And I think it's a symptom of our very diseased and corrupt society that this is still a thing to celebrate death and violence and destruction and the decorations are just disturbing. I hate walking down the street even. It's just seeing all these, like, what, why, why is this okay to decorate your house with body parts and skulls and s scary, like, I don't, know, I don't get it. I really don't get it. It, yes, yes. For sure, yes. I hear you, yeah. It's become, it's become like a Hallmark holiday. Yeah, it's been commercialized. But at what is at the root of it? Why are people doing these things? Why are people happily glorifying death and destruction? It's just it's absolutely bizarre. Atheism, yes, that's true. Yeah. Where pain yeah. and pleasure and fear produce pleasure. So society in this respect is producing a source of pleasure, a dopamine right. discharge, and it's the seeking of pleasure that people are... Yeah, I get that. Like. I get they that. They actually are yeah. not seriously... Looking to That's why I'm saying it's a symptom of our diseased society that only cares about material pleasures and another dopamine boost from this thrill of the, the horror, right? And uh, not even talking about the whole thing of all this sugar giving, being given to children to drive all the obesity and diabetes and attention deficit and all these other things. So it's bad in every possible way. I, I don't see anything positive about this um, weird pagan thing called Halloween. So that's our segue to discuss the practice of visiting the graves of Sadiqim, Lehavdil, or going to cemeteries, because what is the Jewish, the authentic Jewish view of visiting a cemetery and paying respect to the righteous dead? So where did it come from? So we want to go through, we want to go through the Tanakh, start with the Chumash, go through the Tanakh, 
where there's mention of cemeteries, graves, burials, then go into Gemara, Zohar, and kind of do the whole thing. So we're going to go through all this long journey. Where is the first place in Chumash, in the Torah, where is the first place that we see an open discussion about burial, somebody dying, somebody getting buried, a cemetery? Sarah. Right, Sa- Sarah, with Sarah and Avraham Avinu, right? Parashat Chaye Sarah, that Sarah passed away, and Avram went to Me'erat HaMachpelah. He bought that special cave and he wanted that specific cave to be her burial place. And we know that that, that has become like a, a, a holy site, a pilgrimage site for Jews. That's where Sarah was buried and then Avram was buried there and then Itzhak and Rivka. And then uh, Yaakov and Leah were buried there, not Rachel, which we're going to talk about. We'll come back to Rachel. And according to tradition, Adam and Eve were also buried there originally. And Esav's head, or something? And head according to that famous Midrash, Esav's head was also buried there. The, the more <laughs> mystical teachings is that why did Abraham want that specific place? Why did he designate that specific place or want that specific place to bury Sarah? Because that was actually where Adam and Eve were buried originally. So it's considered a very holy site. Now, the Torah doesn't actually tell us that this is a particularly holy site. It doesn't say all of that. All of that stuff comes from you know, oral traditions. The Torah itself is very terse and just says, Abraham bought that land and buried Sarah there, and that's the end of the story. So that's one. Then what's the next uh, major? So we said Rachel. We're going to come back to the burial of Rachel, that Yaakov buried her along the road. If you remember, she passed away in childbirth while they were, the family was traveling, and then he passed her by. The, he buried her on the road. So we're going to come back to that one. That's next. And then what's the next case of where's the next place where we see burial Good, yeah. Then you have the whole death and burial of, uh, actually even mummification of Yaakov and Yosef. Yeah, because it was in Egypt, so they were actually mummified even and put in a sarcophagus. And then we see that Yosef, when he, before he passed away, he asked the, his descendants, whoever it was, his family, that when you eventually go back to Israel, make sure you take me with you. Take my bones, take my corpse, yeah, take my corpse with you. And so we read during the Exodus, we read that Moshe actually, because he had made the Israelites swear, Yosef had made the Israelites swear that they would not leave his body in Egypt. And we'll see later why that was. Why did Yosef not want to stay in Egypt? We'll come back to that. The Gemara discusses it. And so Moshe went and found the sarcophagus of Yosef on the eve of the Exodus and took it with him. And if you remember in the last class, we said that it was Serach Bat Asher that helped him find it. Right? The, the granddaughter of Yaakov, Serach, if you remember her story, that she was blessed to live a, a very, very long life. And she was there and she knew where Yosef was, Yosef's sarcophagus was. And she helped Moshe find it. Actually, there is a place that's believed to be the burial plot of Yosef in Egypt. In Goshen, actually, where the Israelites lived. In like the north... A person of a different... Yeah, in the northeast of Egypt, there's like a big kind of cemetery that has one major uh, mausoleum with a guy who looks very Semitic, not Egyptian. So in this place in Goshen, they actually found kind of like a cemetery with one ma- main mausoleum and then a bunch of others around it, which are, is thought to be the other brothers of Yosef that were buried around him. And the person's characteristics seem to match the biblical description of Yosef. So many believe that that's actually his, uh, his grave. Clarify. In that place in Egypt, in Goshen, they actually found like a, a body. There was another, not the same one, there was another mummy of a, of a person named Yuya that was found. And his description, right, the description of Yuya matches Yosef very, very, very accurate closely. And I wrote about that in, in Garments of Light, in the first volume of Garments of Light. There's an essay there about Yosef and Yuya. So if you have the book, you can read it. It's, also, it's on the website, I think, too, that the story of Yuya matches very closely the biblical story of Yosef. So that's another possibility. Those are two different possibilities. Right, that's the problem with that. Some historians identified Yuya with Yosef. The problem with that is that Yuya is still, they found it in Egypt. So it's maybe 
Yeah, so it's not, it's not certain exactly who it is, but there's a lot of compelling evidence in Egypt that Yosef's story is corroborated in Egyptian texts and places and archaeology. And then, this is important because the Israelites were carrying the, the sarcophagus of Yosef throughout their 40 years in the wilderness. And so what problem did emerge from that? Do you remember what came out of that issue? There's a holiday that we have that's associated with the people that carry the bones of Yosef. You know what I'm talking about? Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni, exactly. Even you know, there's Pesach Sheni, right? A month after Passover, a month after Pesach, there's Pesach Sheni. On the 14th of Iyav, exactly one month later, if you remember the story in Bamidbar, it says, Vayehi anashim asher la nefesh adam. There were people who were impure because of the impurity of death because they were next to a corpse, pesach they couldn't do Pesach in the right time in the month of Nisan, because they were impure. They couldn't, bring us, they couldn't do the sacrifice because they were impure. And so they approached Moshe and Aaron and said, well, what do we do? We didn't celebrate Pesach. And then God said, a month later, for those who were impure because somebody had died, you know, it happens. You know, if a, if a family member, God forbid, dies like Elif Pesach or whatever it is, and the person's impure because they've been next to a corpse, so they can't participate in the old Pesach rituals. So what do you do? So the Torah says, so they should celebrate a month later. Exactly a month later, there's Pesach Sheni. There's a second Passover opportunity, and they can do the whole thing with matzah and maror and whatever. They can do the Pesach one month later. So that this connects directly to Atzamot Yosef because the commentaries say, who were these people that were impure from, dead, from a dead corpse that were tmeim le nefesh adam, that were impure because of a nefesh of a, of, of a person? The commentaries say that that person was Yosef. These were the people that had the privilege of carrying the bones of Yosef, but because they were carrying his corpse, they were impure. So what does that tell you? That tells you that, as we already know, that corpses, even buried corpses, even though they've been buried for a long time, have tuma. They actually, they are impure. Which begs the question, how can a kever of a, even a tzaddik like Yosef, he was the first tzaddik. Yosef is Yosef a tzaddik. We call him the tzaddik, right? Yosef is the epitome of the righteous person. And the bones of Yosef caused tuma, even decades later, caused tuma in the people that carry him. So it begs the question, which we have to address. How can something that the Torah says causes Tum'ah be a place also somehow of Kedusha, of holiness? How can we refer to a Kever of a Tzaddik as a place of holiness if the Torah tells us that it's impure? And you can't even, if you've been in contact with it, you can't even bring the Pesach. You can't do the Pesach. You can't do these rituals, right? So we have to explain that. The Chiskuni actually wonders about this because he says this, this tradition's a little... Strange, because he's saying there's actually two opinions as to who the people in the wilderness were carrying. These people who needed a Pesach Sheni, Asher Ayut Meim, Rabbi Yitzhak Omer, Im Nosei Arono Shel Yosef, Yecholim Leitaer, Ve Im Nosei Arono Shel Nadav Ve Avihu, Yecholim Leitaer. So there's two opinions. Some say that they were carrying the bones of Yosef. Some say they were carrying the bones of Nadav, the corpse of Nadav and Avihu. Remember the sons of Aaron? Aaron had four sons, and two of them, Nadav and Avihu, brought a strange fire, the Torah says. They did something they shouldn't have done. They participated in a ritual they were not allowed to participate in, and they died on the spot. But they were considered righteous. Like, we consider those people holy people, and there's a lot of uh, debate as to why, what happened to them, why did they die, what was the reason for these two young men dying this untimely death. But they were righteous. We consider them righteous. So either these impure people who needed a Pesach Sheni, either they were impure because they were carrying Yosef, or they were carrying Nadav and Avihu, or both. Or somebody else. Maybe they because of a family member, whatever it was. But he's saying they could have already been purified. Yecholim le'itav. So like, what is this? This is really puzzling. So there is more to this discussion, but we're going to leave that aside from now. The big question is, how can it be that, how can you have Tuma and Kedusha? We see clearly here that the corpse of a tzaddik, whether it's Yosef or, 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 or Nadav and Avihu, still causes impurity. So how could there be holiness in a place where a tzaddik is buried? We have to address that question. That's Yosef. What's the next and final place that the Torah speaks of the burial of a righteous person? 
that we just read last week on Simchat Torah. Right, this parashat v'zot ha'bracha, the last parsha in the Torah, said vayamot sham Moshe. Moshe passed away. Uh, he was Eved Hashem, the servant of God, and he was he passed away. As we know, he never merited to enter the Holy Land. He passed away be'eretz Moav on the east side of the Jordan River, and it's the Torah says velo yada ish et kavurato ad hayom azeh, and no person knows exactly where he was buried until this day, and that was deliberate. The Torah deliberately hid, unlike Merat Machpela, the cave of the patriarchs, where we know exactly where it is, and the Torah tells us exactly where it is. Here, it's like, no, we don't know exactly where he was buried. And it's deliberate. And again, Chizkuni says, why did that happen? Why did, why did the, the Torah want to keep Moshe's resting place hidden? So that other people won't want to bury their dead there. I want to be buried next to Moshe, right? He's holy, I want to be buried there. And, and so that the necromancers won't come and try to communicate with him. If we knew where Moshe was buried, guess what would happen? We'd all go there, we'd write letters to Moshe, we'd ask him to pray for us, right? So. Do you think that we need to be at the site of where they are buried? Not really, right? Apparently. Is that a punishment for his. I don't think it's a punishment. Just as the Torah prohibits being shoel metim, you're forbidden, doresh metim, you're forbidden from seeking to communicate with the dead. There's a reason they're dead, so that you don't speak to them. You speak to living people. Once a person has died, that means God has decided that he doesn't need to be in this world anymore and communicate with mortals. So that, the Chizkuni makes that clear in other commentaries as well that Moshe's burial place was specifically hidden so that people won't try to come and communicate with him or pray to him. Now, we know that, we know generally where Moshe was buried because the Torah tells us the area. Where was Moshe buried? Between this and that. Yes, but, and it gives us the name of the mountain. What was the mountain where he was buried? Har Nevo. Nevo, right? So it's a huge mountain. Somewhere in that area, Moshe was buried on this mountain region of Har Nevo. Yes, it's in this, on the east side of the Jordan River. And Har Nevo is interesting because the sages say Nevo means Nun Bo. Nun means, is an allusion to Nun Sha'are Bina, the 50 gates of understanding, which we've spoken of several times recently. There's 50 gates, heavenly gates of understanding. And the Gemara famously says that Moshe had all 50 except one that he almost res- uh, attained all 50 gates of understanding. He knew almost all the heavenly secrets. And the Gemara in Masachet Rosh Hashanah says, 50 gates of understanding God created in the world. They were all given to Moshe, except one. There's one that he didn't get. And how do we know? And there's a, there's a very clear derivation for it. And it's from Psalm 8. In Tehilim it says, You made him a little bit less than God. That Moshe was so holy that he spoke to God face to face, the only one who spoke to God face to face, who glowed. And it says about Moshe in Psalms that he was a little bit less than, than God. He's called Isha Elohim. He's called like the godly man, the divine man. And he was a little bit less. Than, so he, he, had 50, he had 49 out of the 50 gates. So he was buried on Har Nevo, Nevo is Nun Bo, that this, the mountain itself was some kind of conduit for the 50 gates of understanding. The mountain itself had this power. It was a very important geographically and a very important place. And what's amazing is we know from historical sources that Har Nevo was actually, was indeed worshipped by pagans in the region. Because one of the main gods of the Babylonians and the Egyptians adopted this god, and many of the peoples in this region worshipped this god. His name was Nevo, Nabu. Nabu was one of the main gods of the Babylonians and even the Egyptians. And he's mentioned in Tanakh in at least two places. God says, I will destroy Nabu. I will destroy Nevo. Ishayahu says, Kara Bel, that God will make Bel, right? One of the, the gods, Baal, Bel, bow down. And Kores Nevo, that he, would, he will destroy, that Nevo will cower before him. Basically, God is saying that all of their idols he will destroy ultimately. So, and he's mentioned in Yirmiyahu also. So the Tanakh mentions this idol called Nevo. And the pagans believe that this, they, he was their god of, of actually of wisdom. 
the God of wisdom and understanding and the heavenly scribe in the Babylonian and Egyptian pagan uh, religions, they saw Nevo as this God and they believed that he was on Har Nevo. And so what the Torah comes and does, as it often does, is it seeks to expunge paganism and replace it with something kosher. So Har Nevo, which the pagans worshipped as this mountain of this God, the Israelites essentially conquered that area. Moshe was buried there, and then they made that whole mountain off limits. Nobody could go there so that nobody could practice these pagan rituals there. And they expunged the worship of this Babylonian, Egyptian, Babylonian god Nabu from Har Nevo. So Har Nevo, it's already had from creation, it was a special place that was connected to these 50 gates of understanding. And then the pagans adopted it for their polytheistic false idolatrous rituals. So that's the Chumash. If we move through the, ten, the rest of the Nach, what else, do you, what else comes to mind when you think of burial and uh, graves? Anything else come, come to mind? I thought of three. I don't know if you can think of more, but I thought of three. You gave us two seconds. You've had however long to think of Yeah, I know, but that's... that's give me one. <laughs> so I, I don't mean like... There are many instances of somebody dying and being buried, but I mean like specifically about the kever, like not just the generic that somebody so, died. So you know. I mean, I mean Shaul tried to bring up Shmuel and Abib. Right, so I'm going to get to that oh, as well. Yeah. So that's a Gemara, we'll get to that. Yeah. that. So that's one of them. Yeah, so one of them is the story of Rachel, which is I'm going to get to. So I'm going to go in, in order of how it appears in Tanakh. So I, I thought of three and I found that they're all somehow associated with end of day stuff and Mashiach stuff, interestingly enough. The first one's in Ishayahu. It's one that we quoted again recently in chapter 11, which speaks about Mashiach, which describes Mashiach. Hmm? Good. Yes, good. That's one too. So I'm going in order, in chronological order. So Ishayahu says, So that branch of Yisha, the Ben Mashiach is Mashiach Ben David, David is Ben Ishai. Right, the, so chapter 11 of Ishayah is talking about a Mashiach and it's saying, so Mashiach will be uh, Omed la Nesamim, he'll be like a flag, a standard to all the peoples. <laughs> Elav goim idroshu, so all the nations will seek his counsel. Ve'aheita menuchato kavod, and his resting place will be honored, will be a respected pilgrimage site. Now it's translated as, menuchato is translated as his resting place, but it doesn't have to be translated like that. Because menuchato can also just be where a person rests when they're alive, not necessarily their resting place when they're dead. So typically, people who have a Messiah interpret this as a kever, and like, oh, you see, the resting place of the Messiah will be a great pilgrimage site, which many people will go to. So if you're a Lubavitcher, then you would see, you see the oil, the Rebbe's oil, is a great pilgrimage site. Many people go there. You know, even certain presidents go there. You know, Donald Trump went there recently, right? Um, Javier Mille, Argentina's president, went there before he got elected or right after he got elected. So it seems to match this, right? That uh, many nations will come to this, the resting place of the Messiah. So if you're a Lubavitcher, you're going to point to this and say, see, there you go. The, the Rebbe is Mashiach. Uh, or Lehavdil, if you're a Christian, you would say, you see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Israel, where in Jerusalem, where people believe uh, Jesus' body was buried, it's still a, a holy site for Christians and a pilgrimage site. And Christians go there regularly in Jerusalem. So I'll say, see, this is the fulfillment of, of prophecy that many nations, many people seek to go into this kevel. You know, everybody uh, who has a Messiah will point to this as, as proof of their particular Messiah. But what people forget is the very next few verses, which say... That, of course, when this happens, when Mashiach comes, what he will have to actually do all those things that Mashiach is supposed to do first, before he dies. And he will be Asaf Nidchei Israel. He will gather the ingathering of the exiles. That all the Jews have to be living in Israel at the time, which hasn't happened. And And if you remember, it says... The, all the various peoples of Israel, Ephraim, Yehuda, and so on, will be ve'afu will together go yama to, to the west, 
to the Philistine coast, you know where that is today, Yavozu et Bnei Kedem, Edom u Moav, they will defeat all of their regional oppressors, Edom, Moav, Ammon, all these places. None of that has happened, right? We're still in the midst of a terrible war. We have not defeated the Philistines or the Ammonites or the Moabites or today's incarnations of these peoples. Israel's still very much at war. There's still many millions of Jews outside of Israel. None of this has happened. So obviously the Messiah that this is speaking of in chapter 11, whose resting place will be a pilgrimage site, that Messiah has not yet come. So even if you read Menuchato as his resting place, then uh, it's not, none of this has happened yet. So it, it, yet it remains to be seen who this Mashiach is. The next one is in Yirmiyahu, chapter 31, which we did in depth in the series on Mashiach ben Yosef. If you remember Jeremiah 31, that's where he talks about Rachel weeping for her children at the end of days. And God says, don't cry, mi nikolech mi bechi, I will bring back all the hostages, yeshuvu banim ligvulam, all those that have been captured, all those that have been taken away, I will bring them back. Rachel is crying for her children. And why is that the case? Why Rachel? Why not somebody? Why not Leah is crying for her children? Because if you remember what it says in, in Sefer Bereshit, V'tamot Rachel v'tikaver baderech, that she died, like we said, on the path while the family was journeying, and she was buried on the road by Ephrata, by Ephrat, he Beit Lechem, so she was buried next to Beth- Beth- Bethlehem today, which is uh, Yehuda and Shomron area, and uh, on the west side of the Jordan River. Vayatsev Yaakov matseva al kvurata, and Yaakov put a pillar by her grave. He matsevet kvurat Rachel ad hayom. And the book of Genesis actually says that that place, the tomb of Rachel, is there to this day. Meaning, it's been around for centuries. It's a very well-known place. And the Sforno explains, why did Yaakov need to put a pillar there? So he buried her on the way. Why did he put a pillar there? Because, because it was on the road. Because there would be grave robbers that would try to go there. So he put up this uh, pillar, I guess, to, first of all, so that people don't overrun this place because it's in the middle of a road. It's by a roadway so that people recognize that somebody special is buried there and to, apparently, to prevent grave robbers from trying to exhume the body and so that they would know that this is the place of the great Rachel and everybody would respect that place and nobody would touch it. This is one of the oldest Jewish holy sites, the tomb of Rachel, and Jews have always sought throughout the centuries to keep it in good repair, and they've always pilgrimaged there, prayed there. Moses Montefiore famously gave lots of money to rebuild it in the 1800s, and it's always been like a central... If you look at the historical records that we have, various travelers throughout history have gone there, And if you look at their descriptions, they always say that this is a holy place for Jews and Jews are praying there and living nearby. Jews have always venerated this place. Unlike Muslims who have never venerated this place. And in 1995, the Palestinians actually attacked it and tried to burn it down. So for Muslims, this is not a holy site. So of course, of course, in 2015, guess what the United Nations did? In 2015, the United Nations declared the tomb of Rachel a Muslim Palestinian holy site. An integral part of Palestine. That's in. So it goes to show you the extent of the propaganda, the pro-Palestinian Pallywood propaganda, and the the collaboration of the United Nations in wiping out Jewish history. Mamash chutzpah, like just brazen, completely deleting historical facts, erasing history. A tomb that literally in 1995 Palestinians tried to burn down somehow in 2015 became a Palestinian holy site and quote in the UN report an integral part of Palestine. So the wiping away of Jewish history and the invention of Palestinian history here is just incredible. But so I wrote a whole essay about the tomb of Rachel. I'll, I'll link to it in the video description if you can read it about the whole history of the site and all the sources and historical sources about it. So why was Rachel, why did she deserve or why was she destined to be buried on the road? As the Midrash famously says, Why did Yaakov bury her there? He saw 
through the Holy Spirit, prophetically, that the Jewish people would go into exile and pass by this road during the Babylonian exile and future exiles. That's why he buried her there. So that she would pray for her children going into exile. And that's why it's written in what we're reading now, Yirmiyahu chapter 31, Rachel Mevaka al right? Jeremiah says, God hears this great voice in Rama. What is this voice? Rachel Mevaka al that Rachel, our mother, our collective mother, is crying over her children because they've been taken away. And God says, Stop crying, wipe away your tears. You will get your reward. The children will come back from the land of the enemy. And there's hope for you. God says, And the children shall return to their borders. That's the prophecy in Jeremiah that we're very much living today. And hopefully we will soon see everybody, all the children of Rachel, return to Israel safely, God willing. So this is really our first source that there's some connection of a kever, of a righteous person to their kever, that the soul of that righteous person perhaps is somehow connected to that place and is even praying for or seeking mercy from Hashem for people who are alive, where a deceased person is somehow interceding perhaps on behalf of the living. This is our first and perhaps only source in Tanakh that speaks of this. The last one in Tanakh is, as Mike said, about Gog and Magog, which we also read recently on Sukkot. It was the Haftara. We read about the war of Gog and Magog on Sukkot, on Shabbat Sukkot. And there it says that after the war, So that God will actually make a cemetery, a tomb of Gog in Israel. They will bury Gog and all of his followers there. And then it will take, we read this, that it'll take seven months to purify the Holy Land from all the corpses at the end of days. So that's the third place that specifically speaks of a kever, of a, some kind of grave in Tanakh. And you'll notice that they're all very messianic end of days. Isaiah chapter 11, Yirmiyahu 31, Yechezkel 39, they're all in end of days prophecies. So that's very interesting. So the pshat in, in the Torah is that, as we see many times in the Chumash, that dead bodies are tameh. It's a really high level of impurity. It's the highest level of impurity is the impurity of death. It can only be removed with para aduma, right? With the ashes of the red cow, which we also await. We have the red cows, but uh, we, we need Mashiach, you know, to do the, these rituals to produce the special powder the ashes of the red cow to produce that special mixture that you sprinkle on somebody and that purifies them from the impurity of death. So that's what we see in Tanakh. In Tanakh we see that really dead bodies just give Tumah. There's no particular significance to the grave of a person, seemingly. And the only real place where we see a soul of the deceased speaking for her children is Rachel. Although, of course, you can read that passage metaphorically. You can always read these passages metaphorically, but we take it literally, that Rachel, the spirit, the soul of Rachel is, is indeed crying for her children. Now we can move on to rabbinic sources. The Gemara, famous Gemara that you brought up, the, probably the only main big source that has some kind of intercession where a person goes to a grave to pray for assistance is Kalev. So this is in Masechet Sota, and it's commenting on the story of the spies in Bamidbar, the sin of the spies, right? Moshe sent 12 spies to scout the land in preparation for Israel's conquest. 10 of the spies come back giving a false report. The people panic. And then God says, okay, you don't want to go to Israel? Fine, stay in the wilderness for 40 years. That was their punishment. And only two of the spies gave a positive report, Yoshua and Kalev. So they merited to actually enter the Holy Land. And they became great leaders of Israel after Moshe. The other 10 spies and the whole generation of adult men perished in the 40 years in the wilderness. So Kalev, when, when the Torah says, Vayalu Negev, it says the spies went up the Negev. Vayavo ad Hebron. And he came to Hebron. That's bizarre language. This is the sentence, the verse in the Torah. They went up the Negev and he went to Hebron. 
Who's he? It should have said they went. They went up the Negev and they went to Hebron. But it says they went to the Negev and he went to Hebron. And so the Gemara says, Melamed, Shaperash Kalev Miatzad Meraglim, that Kalev went off on his own. Caleb, Ve'alach ben Nishtatach al Kivrei Avot. And he went and he prostrated himself at the graves of the patriarchs in Hebron, the cave of the Merat, Merat HaMachpelah, and said, Avotai, so he beseeched the forefathers, Bikshu alai rachamim, pray for me, so that I should be spared from these other wicked spies so that I won't join them in their false report. So that's what the Gemara famously says. It seems to be clearly intercession that Kalev went and to the cave of the patriarchs and asked them to pray on his behalf to help him. Now that said, various commentaries say that he didn't actually necessarily pray to the patriarchs. He prayed to God he just wanted the merit of the patriarchs to assist him. So the Bach says this, for example. He says, This kind of looks like Doresh Elametim. You know, going to a cemetery and speaking to the dead. Isn't that, doesn't the Torah forbid that? To go and try to communicate with the dead? And he says, The Kalev Shanishtatach al Kivrei Avot, Hitpalel Lashem Bamakom Kedusha, Kideshat Yet Filato Nishmat. So no, he prayed to God, he prayed to Hashem, but just in that place where the holy patriarchs were buried, which would help him, so that it will make his prayer more likely to be heard. That's what the Bach says specifically, and other commentaries as well, that he didn't really pray to the patriarchs. He just went there to get some inspiration, some chizuk from the patriarchs, some strength. He still prayed to Hashem, and he just wanted the merit of the patriarchs to help him. So is this where we get that? Yes. So this is a major source where people say, look, you see, so it is okay to go to the graves of Tzadikim and ask them for intercession because Kalev seems to have done it. So there's two points to address here. Number one, first of all, this is happening in Israel. And we're going to see that there is a big difference between the Holy Land and all other lands. Second of all, he's going to the cave of the patriarchs, which has a clear source in the Torah. It's actually explicitly mentioned in the Torah, and it's the place of the Avot, of whom the Torah describes as God's beloved. Right? God says over and over again in the Torah, I took you out of Egypt, not in your merit, but in the merit of your forefathers, because of Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov. I brought you to Israel, even though you were stiff-necked, because I promised it to Avram, Isaac, Yaakov. So the Torah over and over again says how great they were. And how God specifically loved them, how they were, you know, genuine prophets of the highest caliber, close to Hashem. So with the Avot, we have a guarantee. But with other rabbis, as great as, great as they may have been, sure, we respect them, we honor them, but they're not prophets. They, we don't have a guarantee from the word of God, from the Torah, that they were his absolute servants and that they were prophets and they were close to him and that in their merit, you know, he did, that God worked miracles. But we have that guarantee from Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So there is a clear distinction between the Avot and like everybody else. And it's in Israel and it's in the cave of the patriarchs. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So you say we have the tomb of Rachel and the cave of the patriarchs. These are the only sources that we have for any kind of intercession. They're both in Israel. Even the tomb of Moshe, which is on the other side of the Jordan, doesn't count, apparently. It was specifically hidden so that people don't go there for intercession. But if it's in the proper holy land, then maybe it does work. So we have a source for Kever Rachel and Merata Machpela. That we have. And you can argue also Kever Yosef, because he was taken to Israel and buried in Israel. Yes, exactly. You can see them as portals. Me'erat HaMachpelah is indeed described as kind of like a heavenly portal, a channel of communication. Some will even say that's where the souls of the righteous dead ascend through Me'erat HaMachpelah to heaven. So that is like very much a channel. Right, exactly. So these places have access to the heavenly realms. If you remember in the series on Mashiach ben Yosef, in the last part of that, we discuss what the Zohar says about how Mashiach will return from heaven. He'll take a trip to heaven like others did before him, like Eliyahu did, like Chanukh, right? Enoch went up to heaven. Mashiach will take a trip through heaven, the Zohar says, and he'll be, a, he'll be um, 
adorned by the patriarchs and so on. And he'll be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? His, uh, his armor will be placed upon him by Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Moshe. And then he'll come back to earth, the Zohar says, through Kever Rachel. And she will arise and she'll give him a kiss. Remember, we talked about this. So it was in the Mashiach Ben Yosef series. So the tomb of Rachel is also a portal to the heavens. So these places in the Holy Land serve as channels to the heavens. Me'erat HaMachpela, Kever Rachel. These are genuine kind of holy sites, stargates, whatever you want to call them. Now, the counter argument somebody can say is that corpses have no, no value, no power. Because we read in Tehillim, there's various verses in Tehillim, and we say them, a lot of them on Hallel, during Hallel, on the holidays, that the dead have no life. Lo hametim li hallelujah. Velo kol duma. The dead don't praise you. We will praise you because the dead don't praise you. The dead have no communication, right? We say this in Hallel all the time. Lo hametim ya hallelujah. The dead cannot praise God. They can't besiege God for you. You have to pray God. We will pray, pray to God because we can being alive. The dead can't, right? It says this all over Tehillim, right? In uh, Psalm 88, it says, Chalalim shokhvei kever, those who are in the kever, in the graves, what are they? Asher lo zachartam od, you don't even remember them anymore. They're gone. Right? You've cut them off. You don't look after them anymore. They're dead. They're gone. So there are many verses like this that the Sadducees would have pointed to, by the way. Remember that Tzdukim, that Tzdukim 2,000 years ago did not believe in an afterlife. And they pointed to verses like this. They said, you see, the dead are no more. The dead are gone. There's nothing to the dead. Life is all here. The Chumash doesn't mention an afterlife explicitly. So the Tzdukim who... Right, right, right. So they would have read that metaphorically. They would have seen that all metaphorically, right? They would have said, the Chumash never mentions an afterlife. The Chumash never meant the actual Torah of Moses. They went, the Tzedukim went according to, strictly to the Torah of Moses. The Torah of Moses never mentions an afterlife, never says anything about dead people praying for living people or intercession. So the Sadducees would have completely denied any of this. And they would point to these verses in Psalms and other places as saying, you see, there is no, the dead can't pray for you. The dead don't live. It's all about the living. Right? God is the God of the living. God is called in Tanakh, El Chai, the God of the living. We translate it as the living God, but that kind of doesn't make sense. It's El Chai means God of the living and not the God of the dead. He's called the God of the living. And that's one of the, one of the ten main names of God is El Chai. It's often associated with El Shaddai. With the Shmuel, when the psalm was, he said, you mean, with tomorrow. And... Yes, I'm going to get to Shmuel as well. So I'm, I'm just pointing out the counter argument. Saying this is what a person might say otherwise. Right? So we have a source. I believe we have a good source for Merat HaMachpelah and Kever Rachel in the Holy Land. We have Tanakh sources for that. But there, you could make a counter argument. One could even technically even deny that. So I'm just putting it out there. And remember, don't forget what it says about Moshe. That specifically his tomb was buried so that people wouldn't seek his burial place to try to communicate. Even with Moshe, the greatest person, Isha Elohim. And uh, about the idea of Atzamot Yosef, that they really cause Tuma, that even the corpses of even the most righteous people still cause Tuma, not Kedusha. They cause impurity, not, not holiness. So we still have to keep these things in mind. So where does the actual practice of going to these places and praying and maybe asking for intercession, where does it come from? It comes from, as you might expect, from the Zohar specifically. So we're going to see what it says. It actually starts, it's in Parashat Acharei Mot which is appropriate, because Acharei Mot means after death. So the Zohar on Parashat Acharei Mot, after death, says that sometimes, that's how it begins, that, a person, that the world sometimes needs, the Jewish world sometimes needs Rachamim. We need compassion from God, either because of strict persecution or because there's no rain in Israel, the Zohar says. There's a great drought, which is a common problem in the Holy Land. So there's... You know, bad things are happening to the Jewish people. So in these times, what should we do? What can we do? And the Zohar tells us, first it goes through, it reminds us that there's three main levels to the soul. There's really five, but there's three main ones. You remember the three levels of the soul? Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, right? And then there's two more, Chaya and Yechida after, but those are more esoteric. The main three souls that we generally interact with on a daily basis is the lowest Nefesh, then Ruach, then Neshama. Nefesh is just in your, the basic life force. It's associated with the bloodstream. 
Ruach is associated with your vital organs. It's a little more. It's associated with your inclinations, your emotions. And then the Shama, which is associated with your mind, your intellect, your consciousness. It's associated with your brain. That's the highest level of soul. So the Zohar says that when a person dies, all their souls go up to heaven, except a part of the nefesh. A little bit of the nefesh remains in the grave. Perhaps until the body completely decomposes and possibly even after, even after the body decomposes. There is also a tradition that the bodies of the most righteous people don't decompose. So there is some nefesh that remains in the tomb, in the grave, around the body, in that place. That's what the Zohar says. And amazingly, the Zohar says that all of these, the, these nefeshot of all the, the righteous dead in Israel, they form like an internet and they're able to communicate with each other. So the Zohar is saying that you can go to the grave of a tzaddik like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, let's say, and in Meron, as long as, again, it's in the Holy Land, and his soul will be connected to the cave of the patriarchs. And remember, the cave of the patriarchs is the stargate to heaven. And so there would be like this internet communication where one nefesh would deliver the message to another nefesh, and through this, the patriarchs, through Me'erat HaMachpela, that message is more likely to be delivered to heaven and have some more oomph and more power. So that's basically what the Zohar is saying. It's a very long passage. It goes on for many paragraphs and explains this. Now, the Zohar is saying that this is not something that should be done by you and I, by the typical individual. And it gives the procedure for how to do it and says you actually have to bring a Torah scroll with you. You have to take an oraita samuch kivre. You have to take a Torah scroll next to the grave. And that Torah scroll then has the power, ve'inun mit'are al oraita. Because of the Torah there, it awakens the nefesh in the tomb. So the Zohar says you have to bring a Torah scroll to the grave of this righteous person in the Holy Land. And the Torah scroll will awaken the soul of that, whatever residual nefesh is left there. And the Zohar warns that you should not do this. Only the most righteous people who know these mystical secrets should do it. And you have to fast before you try to attempt this. One opinion is three days. One opinion is a minimum of one day. So you have to fast either one full day or perhaps even three days. And then a group of tzaddikim should go together. And then the merit of all of them, plus the Torah scroll, all of that will arouse the nefesh. And through Me'erat HaMachpela, it can bring down mercy. And the Zohar says, Woe, voy lahen, they come, the empty ones that come there, woe to them who try to do this, because they're actually making the opposite effect. It's no good. You have to be completely righteous. You've done tshuva. You've fasted. You come with a group of mystics and real Talmidei Chachamim, righteous people, with a Torah scroll, and then you can attempt this procedure. And the Zohar does understand the issue of Doresh HaLamitim and it asks, well, isn't this Doresh HaLamitim? Isn't this like trying to communicate with the dead? It's forbidden, no? And the Zohar says, well, it's forbidden if you do any of these other pagan rituals, but doing it this way is okay. And only if it's a righteous, a genuine righteous person of Israel, because Doresh HaLamitim, the Metim is referring to like the unrighteous dead, but the righteous are called living even when they're dead. It's not really Doresh HaLamitim, and it uses a verse from King Solomon in uh, Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. In Kohelet, King Solomon says, V'shabeachani et hametim shekvar metu, and I praise the dead that have already died. The truth is that Kohelet was saying this, as we discussed a couple of months ago, because he has a very negative view of the world, and he's saying life is meaningless, and it's better to be dead than alive, so I'm praising the dead that have already died. It's better to be dead than alive. That's what Kohelet is really saying. But the Zohar reinterprets that and says, no, no, no. Shlomo was actually alluding to this practice saying, if they are truly righteous dead, then you can, through them, you can seek some mercy, you know, on your behalf through their merit. So that's what the Zohar says. So the Zohar itself is very nervous about this and is saying it could very well, it does very well seem to smell like Doresh HaLamitim, so you shouldn't do it. Maybe nobody knows how to do it. It requires a group of the most elite mystics with a Torah scroll after fasting in Israel in a very specific place. So the Zohar, even the Zohar is very nervous about this practice, right? So this is not just for the average Jew. Now, if you remember the story of Shaul, that's probably the most explicit of being Doresh HaLamitim, of trying to seek the dead. King Saul 
King Saul always went to Shmuel the prophet for advice. And then Shmuel passed away. It says in the book of Shmuel, Shmuel met kol Israel, berama. So he was buried. Shmuel the prophet died. He was buried. Veshaul hesir ha'ovot yidonim mi ha'aretz. And what Saul had previously done, King Saul, was actually get rid of all the necromancy in Israel. He forbid it because the Torah forbids it. So King Saul made a very Torah-based kingdom and he got rid of all the necromancers in Israel so that nobody could communicate with the dead. But ironically, he now wanted to communicate with Shmuel because his trusty advisor and prophet was no longer with him. And there was a war with the Philistines. The Philistines invade and Shaul doesn't know what to do. And that's usually why people go to these places because they want... They don't know what to do. Life hands you lemons. And instead of making lemonade, you go to the grave of a righteous person and ask for answers. So usually when people are struggling in life, they want answers. They want clarity. Shaul was scared. He didn't know what to do. He says, okay, I'm going to go and awaken the soul of Shmuel. So what did he do? He tried to find, to speak to God through the temple procedures, through the Urim V'tumim. But God had already abandoned Shaul, and he wouldn't answer him. God wouldn't answer him, not through the prophets, not through the Urim V'tumim, not through the dreams. So then he had no choice and, but, he, to, but to go to a necromancer. But Tomer Aisha Alav, he came to the witch of Endor. Remember the famous, uh, this woman in Endor? She's called the witch of Endor often. And Vatomer Aisha Alav, she told him, He dressed up as somebody else so that people wouldn't know that it's the king. And she said, hey, but the king banned this. You're putting me, my life at risk by asking me to do this necromancy. Are you like trying to trap me here? You know that I'm going to die for doing this. But he promises her that she'll be okay. And she summons the soul of Shmuel. And Shmuel says, Shmuel al Shaul, Lama irgastani la'alototi. Like, why did you irgastani? Why did you disturb me? Why did you, you're, this is very distressing for the soul that you're trying to communicate with me, that you're bringing me up. And King Saul said, you know, I'm in trouble and I want you to tell me what to do because you know, I don't know what to do. So that's often when people are, have unclear, their life is full of struggle. They're looking for some necromancy to get information. But God says, you can't do that. Trust me. You have to have faith in Hashem that everything will be okay. I know it's like a temptation to go to an astrologer, to go to a fortune teller, to get a school of some sort. Give me something. Fix me. You know, people want the quick fix like we discussed before. It's like people go to a doctor and instead of actually changing their lifestyle, whether it's their diet, exercise, whatever, stress, work, just give me the drug. Give me the quick fix. I need to, I want to fix this problem. You know, that it's very hard to actually change yourself. It's a lot easier to seek a quick fix. Give me a zgula. Give me something. Give me a dose of something, you know. It's not allowed. The Torah has three different mitzvahs for it. Cannot seek to communicate with the dead. Seeking to communicate with somebody who's gone, that's already a lack of faith in Hashem. Yeah. If you're already praying to something invisible, just pray to God. You know what I mean? That's fine. If somebody has extra senses, if, somebody, if God gave them an ability to receive information, that's a different story. That's passive. You're not actively trying to communicate. Yeah, if you're a receiver of information, fine. That's, that's like a prophet. That's a different story. Like prophecy, Ruach HaKodesh. Okay, you can be a receiver. If you have a soul that's in tune and maybe in a dream you receive information, okay, you receive that information. Should you share it with somebody? Maybe not. Maybe it's better that they don't know. So it depends. But again, that's passive, not active. And it's extremely rare anyways for genuine people who genuinely have these abilities. Rabbi Schneerson at 770 was buried in Israel. Yeah. Would it be okay to go to the grave? I mean, it's okay to go to the grave. I'm not saying it's not okay. But to com- seek to communicate with the Lubavitcher Rebbe would be very wrong in Queens. Right. It probably has a little more support in Israel. But even the Tsar said, like, even there, it would, it, it's not so simple to just go and talk to the dead person so what do you do to seek there? answers from the dead. Yeah. Yeah, just pay your respects. Yeah, you can pray, you pray to God. God controls everything. Then why go to another source? If, in fact, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no capability of making a connection between physicality and spirituality. Right. There's absolutely no reason to go to that, to the dead. Right. And the second thing is, if you're looking for a silver bullet, the only source of a silver, silver bullet would ultimately be through your own higher consciousness and connection with God. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's really what the Zohar says, ultimately, that the prayers are really to God, not to these people. The Zohar says, It's really you're doing it in front of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and the, obviously it all comes ultimately from Him, alma, that God will then have mercy on the world, you know, on their behalf, but you're, ultimate, you're praying really to God. At the end of the day, God is your source of salvation. We shouldn't forget that. Your so- the source of your salvation is not any tzaddik, it's not any prophet, it's God. It all comes from God. So perhaps in the merit of certain great tzaddikim, who are buried specifically in the Holy Land, it can help. Right? And again, the Zohar says that it's all coming, it's all a channel through Me'erat HaMachpela, through the cave of the patriarchs. And what the Zohar is saying is really paralleling what the Gemara says. Because in the Gemara in Masechet Ketubot, it's a very famous Gemara, it talks about the difference between the Holy Land versus all other lands. And really, you should read that whole, conversa- that whole passage. Because it starts by saying, you know, a person who's not in the Holy Land is like an idolater, is like an atheist. You know, Torah observance really should be in Israel. That whole passage in Ketubot, it starts on around page 110, 111. It's talking about how special the land of Israel is and how we should all really seek to live there. Right? This is the holy land. Torah should be observed in the land of Israel. You know, a religious Jew should really be in Israel. So we're all hypocrites for living here. And God willing, we should all be in Israel soon. You know, but meanwhile, we're here. But the, Zohar, uh, the Talmud's all up talking about the value of the holy land. And then it says, Anybody who's buried in Israel, it's as if they were buried mamash under the temple altar in the very like, holiest place in the world. And it gives various proof for it. And one of them is in Parashat Hazinu, which, which says, Vechiper admato amo that God's land atones for his people. So if you're buried in the Holy Land, it's like you're buried under the sacrificial altar where the sacrifices were brought for atonement. And be- being buried in Israel itself purifies you from your sins, essentially. It atones for all your sins being buried in Israel. And the Gemara continues, Amar Rabbi Elazar, Metim Einam Chaim. All those who die and are buried outside of Israel, they're not alive. You know, the righteous dead buried in Israel are still called alive. But the righteous dead buried outside of Israel, they're dead. Okay, so there is no value in being buried outside of the land of Israel. Because the land itself is impure. There's only real holiness and purity in the Holy Land. So if a righteous person's buried in Israel, great, that has real value. That righteous person is still Chaim, is still alive, so to speak, their soul. But outside of Israel, in Tuma land, in Uman, in Queens, this is death land. There's no life there. So the Talmud is saying the, the dead that are buried outside of Israel have no life. So again, if you want to go there because, let's say, I've been to the oil, to the Rebbe's oil, and I want to go there to pay my respects. I consider the Lubavitcher Rebbe a personal hero. You know, I see him as a personal inspiration. So yeah, I've been there, not to pray to him, not to write him a letter, not to talk to him, but just to pay my respects to a great inspiring figure. That's it. Nothing wrong with that. And I prayed there to God. That's fine. Anything more than that is probably not fine. So maybe Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's for inspiration. It's for chizuk. You know, Kalev was on an important mission. He said, let me go to Hebron first, pay my respects to my ancestors, get a little spiritual boost. Why did he go? What did he think of going there? What was his mind? Why did he go? Um, I believe the Arizal says that he was a reincarnation of, Eli- uh, exactly, of Eliezer, Avraham's servant. And that was a tikkun that he specifically, the Arizal says that Kalev wanted to go there to his master, Avraham, to reconnect with, because he was the reincarnation of Eliezer. So that's the real reason why he needed to go there. Yeah. He was Avraham's loyal servant. Exactly, exactly. 
So that's the deeper mystical reason for why he had to go. And so this Gemara, that the people who are buried outside of Israel, Einam Chaim, that's also interpreted to mean that they will not come back to life at the end of days. At the Triyat Metim, at the resurrection of the dead, those that are not buried in Israel will not resurrect. Only those that are buried in Israel will resurrect. But we know that that can't be the case. That doesn't sound right. All the righteous dead should resurrect. And so the Gemara explains what's going to happen. How could it be that the righteous that are outside of Israel won't come to life? They will come back to life. Now, Gilgul, we know, means technically reincarnation. But here, Gilgul means they will roll underground. You've probably heard this before. That God made tunnels that there are, Amarabaye, that there are mechilot na'asot lahem bekarka. That God made tunnels, or tunnels will be made for them underground, and they will roll, their corpses will like roll through the tunnels straight to Israel. So it's very hard to believe. That's why I think that I would interpret this personally. My take on it is it's hard to believe that there's going to be now millions of tunnels crisscrossing under the ocean. I believe when the Gemara says here Gilgul, it literally means Gilgul in the Kabbalistic sense of reincarnation. So those that were died and were buried outside of Israel, no problem. They'll be born in Israel, reincarnate in when there's the ingathering of the exiles, Mashiach comes, people will have children in Israel, and the babies that, that will be born will be those people that in a past life were buried outside of Israel. Fine. So this particular great rabbi who was buried in France will be bo- reborn as a baby in a Gilgul in Israel, and he'll know his past life. Like, hey, in my past life, I was this rabbi that was buried over there. So I believe you can understand this quite literally as Gilgul. They will be reborn in Israel the resurrection of the dead will happen through reincarnation, through rebirth in Israel. And I really, t- in the, if you remember the series we did on reincarnation, at the very end in part three, we really talked about this, about how all the souls could actually come back and live, all the parts of Adam, all the different sparks of Adam, like nine and a half billion of them, which is a number that we're approaching in the global population, could all actually come and be born, like Mamash reborn through reincarnation. So that could be a way to accomplish resurrection of the dead. It's a lot more, this view is a lot more, I think, I don't want to say rational because it's still miraculous, but at least it's like practical and just it makes a lot more sense as opposed to people coming out of the ground, corpses like going back to Halloween, like thriller, Michael Jackson's going to come out of the ground and uh, actually he was what, a werewolf? But yeah, I don't... (laughs) It's hard to believe that it's going to be like that thriller, dance, macabre, uh, people coming out of their graves. Although that's often how it might be described in various like Midrashim and things. But it seems hard to believe that. I think it makes a lot more sense that resurrection of the dead will be accomplished by Gilgulim. By reincarnations and people will be reborn and they'll remember their past lives. So they'll know that I was this person in a past life. And that's it. Now you have your very logical, biological resurrection of the dead. I like this new concept. I am just saying, though, that like, it's not beyond the realm. That we could like, you know, come out of the ground and, and be like, all nice and shiny and fabulous. It's hard to believe, especially when you have bodies. Like, people that died a thousand years ago, there's nothing left there. There's nothing left. They say, so they say the loose bone is left. But practically speaking, we don't find these loose bones. We don't, if you go to like, if the, when they dig up like old cemeteries, do you see, do you see these loose bones? You don't. Rabbi Kaplan, Arya Kaplan suggested that the loose bone is really secretly talking about DNA. You know, it's not like a literal bone. The Rabbi Kaplan suggested that will resurrection, he took a different approach. Rabbi Kaplan said that resurrection of the dead might be accomplished by taking DNA remnants and essentially cloning them. Yeah, which, which we're getting to, we're getting the technology to, you know, organ print and things like that. So Rabbi Kaplan suggested maybe that would be the resurrection of the dead using DNA and loses DNA. So it's an interesting possibility. That's what they do in Jurassic Park. Exactly, like Jurassic Park. Like Rabbi Kaplan didn't see Jurassic Park, but uh, he passed away before that. Maybe he read the book. I don't know how, or when was the book published? I don't know. But, uh, I, for sure, neither am I. I'm just saying, what is the more... I'm not saying that this is the way. I'm saying, to me, it's a little more logical and biological. Maybe that's, my, that's me being the biologist. I don't know. So, 
I can see it both ways. I'm also, like I said, I don't like Halloween. I'd be frightened by zombies coming out of the ground. I think I prefer cute babies being born and resurrection of the dead. Now, uh, all of that, all of that said, even though I don't think literally, I mean, I personally don't like to take this Gemara literally that there will be millions of tunnels underground. What I, what I do find valuable, very valuable here is the theme of tunnels in speaking of the end of days and what we're constantly hearing now in the news, constant discussion about tunnels in Gaza, in Lebanon. The truth is that Israel's borders are porous with tunnels, unfortunately. So I do see, at least thematically and perhaps metaphorically, symbolically, this idea of tunnels, hundreds of tunnels deep underground, big enough for trucks and stuff to pass through, certainly corpses. There's definitely something, something strange about tunnels at the end of the day. So this theme of tunnels from the Gemara, I, th- I find just interesting and connected to what's going on in the world. And by the way, that's why the Gemara says, if this is the case, why did Yaakov and Yosef not just stay in Egypt? Why did they not just want to be buried in Egypt? And they say that they didn't want to go through the tunnels and they thought maybe they don't have the merit to go through the tunnels. They'd rather just be buried in Israel so that they would resurrect properly in the Holy Land because the resurrection of the dead will happen specifically in Israel. So that's the important thing. The resurrection of the dead will happen in Israel, and that's why many Jews who pass away outside of Israel do want to be buried in Israel. Now, the Gemara doesn't really like that so much, the Gemara says that Ula wanted to do that. He lived outside of Israel, but he often visited Israel. So he thought that that justifies that he wanted to be buried in Israel. And the rabbi said, eh, you know, it's not the same. If you're living outside of Israel and then only coming to be buried in Israel, that's kind of like loophole. That doesn't count. You got to actually live in it. If you didn't make the sacrifice to live in Israel, then you don't deserve it. You know, for all of us, we're not living in Israel. The people who are living in Israel are all tzaddikim. They're actually bearing the burden of the Jewish people. They're taking a huge sacrifice. And the, a Rav Avram Azulai actually says in Chesed Avram, he says, by the way, you should know that every Jew that lives in Israel is automatically a tzaddik. Doesn't matter who they are. He says, it's an amazing passage. He says, you should know that even if a Jew living in Israel and you think he's wicked, you should know that he's 100% righteous just by the fact that he's living in the Holy Land. Because if he was wicked, the Torah says the land would spit him out. Right, with Takiha Aritz, that the, the land of Israel vomits out the wicked. Like here. Exactly. So those who are living in Israel now, there's huge merit to live in Israel. Right? And they're all, you should look at them all as tzaddikim, secular, religious, doesn't matter. A Jew who lives, and, and how much more so? If they served in the, to protect and did this mitzvah, milchemet mitzvah, to, to, to serve and to defend the Jewish people, and God forbid if they died on behalf of the people, there's no, there's no higher merit than that. These are pure, pure neshamot. They're all tzaddik. So we should look at them all as tzaddikim, first of all. So Ula wanted to do it. The rabbi said, hey, maybe you shouldn't. The Talmud Yerushalmi is even more, gives an opinion that's even more stringent, where two rabbis saw, Ra'u aronot shehen ba'ot la'aretz, la'aretz, that they saw coffins coming to be buried in Israel. And one of the rabbis, Amar Rabbi Bar Kiria, he said, what are they benefiting from this by bringing their dead corpses into the Holy Land? And he says, Ani lehen, he is going to recite the verse in Yirmiyahu. The verse says, Samtem bechayechem, that you put, you despised my land in your life. You didn't make the effort to live in the Holy Land while you were alive. And now you're coming here. V'tavo v'tatamu et arzi b'mitatchen. And now in your death, you're going to come and defile my land. It's chutzpah, no? You lived your whole life outside of Israel. You didn't make the effort to live in Israel. And now you died and said, oh, bury me in Israel. So your dead, impure corpse, you're going to bring to the Holy Land. You're defiling the land with your dead body. While you were alive, you didn't do it. And now, so that the Yerushalmi says that. And we can understand why the Yerushalmi is probably more against this. Because the Yerushalmi was written in Israel by rabbis that lived in Israel. And I'm sure they didn't like the fact that people who didn't live in Israel were coming to be buried in Israel. And today in Israel, this is actually a problem that there's not enough grave sites. There's not enough... They're burying people in walls now, in crypts and catacombs, because there's just no space for cemeteries. It's a big problem. 
And yeah, so ultimately the Yerushalmi concludes the truth is that it's fine to do because the other, uh, the rabbi that's mentioned, Amar Leh, he said, Rabbi al he said, well, it says in Parashat Ha'azinu, V'chiper Admato Amo, the land atones for the people, so it's fine. It's good that they come and bury here, it'll atone for their sins. So ultimately the Allah is that it's okay to do and people do it. Maybe that will bring their children here to come and... Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. So it's not forbidden to do. It is, the Gemara does look at it a little bit negatively. Uh, but any, anyway, so the Talmud makes clear that there's no real value to the land outside of Israel. That land is dead. It's impure. The graves outside of Israel are not particularly special. And that's really why Yaakov and Yosef did not want to be buried outside of Israel. They insisted on being transferred to Israel. And so the graves of great rabbis, there are many of them outside of Israel. They are for sure good, important historical sites. You can visit them for inspiration, for chizuk, as a place to pray to God. But it's not a place to seek to communicate with the actual dead. That, with, you know, that would be Doresh El Amitim. And it's really the, only the graves in the Holy Land that have special power. And the Arizal, if you've ever, ever read like Shara Gilgulim, there are long lists of Kivrei Tzadikim. The Arizal went around the Holy Land and pointed out, this is the grave of this person, here was buried this person, here was buried this person. And again, these are all in the Holy Land. So sometimes people will point to the Arizal for a certain practice that has to do with the dead. But the Arizal only did that again in the Holy Land. And he received, sir, if you remember in the Mashiach Ben Yosef series also, we spoke about how the Arizal revealed the secret of Mashiach Ben Yosef at the grave of Shmaya and Aftalion. That's how that passage is introduced, that they were praying at the graves of Shmaya and Aftalion, and then the Arizal revealed the secret of Mashiach Ben Yosef and the Kavana of Mashiach Ben Yosef. So even the Arizal only really pointed out the graves of the righteous in Israel. So to conclude... To summarize it all, yes, there is some residual nefesh at the grave of a tzaddik for sure. There is some kind of spiritual internet, especially particularly in Israel, where the nefeshot can communicate. There is a way to arouse the souls of the righteous, but the Zohar says it's a very specific process. It requires fasting. It requires repentance. It requires a Torah scroll. It's not really for the average person to do. And generally speaking, you can go to the grave, you can honor the dead for sure, you can pray to Hashem for mercy, for salvation, because your salvation comes from God. The Zohar really only speaks about collective national salvation anyways, not for personal requests. There's no, we don't really have in the early sources any indication that other graves outside of Israel or of anybody else are particularly special. It's really Kever Rachel that we have a, a, a clear source in Tanakh, Merat HaMachpelah that we have a clear source in Tanakh. And uh, anything that's more than praying to God, you know, if you're writing letters to the dead person, if you're seeking an actual answer from that dead person, that is the definition of Doresh El Ametim. And it was forbidden even to go to the grave of Moshe. That's why the grave of Moshe was hidden, so that we wouldn't try to seek to communicate with Moses. You can't have an intermediary between you and God. And I know people will say, well, the Hasidim do it, you know, whether it's Lubavitch, Breslev, the Lubavitcher Rebbe went to the, to the grave of his predecessor, his father-in-law, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, and so on. And, but, but the reality is that not all Hasidim accepted this. If, for example, the Kotsk Hasidim, who were very rational, did not, in, did not like this practice, did not condone this practice, and very famous statement that the Kotsk Rebbe, the Kotsk Rebbe is uh, one of my favorites. He has a lot of great one-liners. I quote him often. If you want like good inspirational quotes, the Kotsk Rebbe is awesome. And one of his, one time he was asked about this practice of going and praying at the graves of Tzadikim, and his answer was, why? The Tzadikim are not there anymore. That was his answer. The Tzadikim are no longer there. You're not going to find them there. So why are you going to pray there? So the Kotskers were actually very rational. And so not all Hasidim have this practice, right? There were rational, more rational Hasidim that understood that there is not particular value in praying at the graves of Tzadikim, especially outside of Israel. Uh, but there are today many tours of Kivrei Tzadikim. It's fine if you want to go for historical reasons, for inspiration, if you felt connected to a certain Tzadik, if you like the Sfarim of a certain Tzadik, and you want to go there just to make that 
that link. So for kavod, it's fine. Like it says in Ishayahu, menuchato kavod, as a place of honoring that place, not as a place to try to communicate with that person. So that's in short, or not that short, but that's the, uh, the whole journey of praying at, or visiting the graves of Tzadikim, praying at the graves of Tzadikim, and we'll, we'll end with that.